All right, welcome everybody. This is uh, another installment of our Wednesday conversations uh, that are part of our uh, March on Milwaukee digital series. You know, this month here in July, we've been talking quite a bit about the intersections of food and culture and the complexities that emerge as a result. Uh, as you all know, we, we, we are building a set of digital uh, modules for teachers and educators to use. And, and this month, we just wanted to spend a little bit of time having a, a set of conversations that help us to reflect on what we're missing as a result of this pandemic. And that's all of our awesome festivals, all of those awesome activities that we're, we, we get to experience, uh, sharing culture, engaging with food and food production in, in rich ways. And then also all the important uh, social political implications of all of that. So I'm Rob Smith, uh, Associate Professor of History, Director for the Center for Urban Research, Teaching and Outreach at Marquette University. And my buddy over there, Adam Carr, you want to say a few things? Yeah, um, I do a different thing, a bunch of different things around Milwaukee. One of them is eat a lot of food and think <laughs> about the places and the people that I get the food from. So I'm happy to be here today with two people who if, if I'm ever around them and partake in their products, I know I'm making good decisions. That's right. That's right. Great decisions. And uh, we have with us uh, two individuals, two names, two icons really here locally, uh, Ms. Zakia Courtney and Mr. Manan Sabir. Welcome to you both. Welcome. Come on into the conversation. Thank hey, you. Uh, yeah. How are you folks doing today? Really well. Yeah. I'm, really well. I'm, I'm doing pretty pretty good too. Just kind of recuperating a little bit after a really great day uh, yesterday in the garden. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, today, you know, we're going to talk about uh, a number of topics. Um, and it's, it's through the lens of urban farming. Uh, and our subtitle is Reconnecting Our Roots. So we want to get into a little bit of that. Uh, but we also want to get into your work around the broader uh, notions uh, associated with community wellness. Uh, you know, we want to we want to give you a chance to to highlight not only where you've been, uh, but what you're doing and where you're headed, and and all of the ways that uh, your experiences here in Milwaukee have have helped to inform uh, the the roles that you all play in in our in our city. And uh, and we we're very thankful of what you provide and. and, and uh, how you continually educate us and raise the, the social and wellness IQ of our city. Uh, so why don't we give you each just a chance to introduce yourselves and then we have a we have this process where we want to get people into the conversation pretty quickly. So we have a, a tool that we use to do that. So Ms. Zakia Courtney, you want to just do a short introduction of yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself and then Manan, jump in after that. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, I have been uh, vegan, vegan vegetarian for almost 30 years now. But prior to that uh, designation, I am the mother of six, but we have a blended extended family. So that's like 15. We have 52 grandchildren. We have about 25 great grand, wait, great grandchildren. No great, great grandchildren yet. And so my love and, and experience with uh, cooking vegan cuisine really simply came from wanting to provide something for my family that uh, was better than what they had before. So if they had something that was a favorite food, just say like spaghetti, everybody loves spaghetti. Well, when we became vegan, then what I wanted to do was to make sure that my spaghetti was as good as what I had prepared mm -hmm. before with meat or even better. And so that part of my journey, uh, I'm very proud of. I'm actually proud of all parts of my journey. I am an educator by, by profession, starting out at Urban Day School and extended through lots of different you know, journeys. And once I started to retire, approach retirement, I started to get more and more requests you know, for food and for, uh, you know, for cooking. And so my journey as a chef really came out of demand, not something that I quote unquote went to school for or I sought to do. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. We're going to dig into some more of that, obviously, as we get into our conversation. So, Manan, what's going on, brother? Talk to us a little bit. Oh, man, I'm, I'm having fun uh, right in this 
a very unusual period of time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, my name is Manon Sabir, and uh, I am the uh, co-owner of the Shindig Juice, also uh, Shindig Coffee brand. Um, we were at once called the Juice Kitchen. Actually, um, the, the name Juice Bar actually was kind of our first iteration before we landed on uh, the Juice Kitchen. So it's quite ironic that we have that under my name, which is, which is it brings me back. Um, but even to take it back a little further, I got my start from my grandfather. And I have to always an honor my ancestors as I, as I try to do, you know, as much as I possibly can. Uh, my grandfather was born in uh, 1895, but in 1908 witnessed his um, friend being hung from a tree uh, outside of a church. That led him to, um, at the age of 13, that led him to uh, work on the railroads. But while working on the railroads, he discovered that he had a love for herbs, um, a strong love for herbs, but not a lot of education. So he utilized his, what was you know, known as his own education to uh, uh, to honor his ancestors and dig into herbs, um, especially using uh, dandelion, the, the root dandelion, or the, also the uh, leaf of the dandelion to heal everybody in his family. So it was, it was 12 kids, uh, two wives, six, six on one, six on the, <laughs> six on the other, uh, everybody lived in the same house. And um, not everybody, if you had a broken bone, you would go to the hospital. But it, it, uh, other than that, it was just, you know, you would go straight to uh, my grandfather. Everybody went to my grandfather, Gus Jackson. So, but I did, I, he died when I was two. Um, ultimately, uh, my own, um, my own uh, life story led me to meet my wife. And then also I became a, a bonus dad. Uh, which in turn helped me to um, understand uh, what I was actually put on earth for, which was to heal. And uh, my son has a condition, which um, uh, it, it's called ectodermal dysplasia. And I always say it because I like to make sure that people recognize that it is a, it's a real life condition that people, uh, it's a rare genetic mutation, um, but it's something that people have that sometimes they may not have one of the conditions is you don't sweat. And um, when you don't sweat, you harbor uh, mucous membranes and they, they gather and get really hard. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, that story, that hit the condition at, at the age of four led me to uh, juice for him. And he hasn't had a hospital stay in, um, I think he's 16, so almost 11, 12 years. So uh, wow. we, we, after that, decided to juice for everybody else and, and from the from juicing at home to juicing uh for everybody else yeah well thank you both for sharing a shot of ginger a day for me every day yeah. Yeah. Uh, every day all righty let, let's uh let's go to the next slide and let's let's get the um attendees into our conversation mr kim and now what we try to do is to keep these conversations as interactive as possible both with the folks here in zoom and the folks joining us on Facebook Live. And what we'd like to do um, is uh, just ask folks to share a little bit about what we're missing out on this summer, given we're dealing with COVID-19. Um, if you can just drop in the chat, folks, any of those festivals, any of those activities that the normal uh, summer run here in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is which is beautiful in so many ways. Share some thoughts about what we're missing out on, and let's get some some even more recent nostalgia into our conversation. And we'll we'll start with uh, Miss Zakia and then Manan follow up. What what are what are some of the things you you feel like we're missing this summer as a result of COVID nineteen? Well, you know, Milwaukee is considered the city of festivals, and I give it that. You know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, amongst all the other issues that we have you know, here in Milwaukee, it is known for the city of festivals. And so you know that every weekend you have an opportunity to attend, you know, uh, uh, from neighborhood festivals to ethnic festivals, you know, to even, you know, summer fest if that's what your choice is. So while I miss the fact that it's not available, I don't miss the fact that we still have an opportunity to gather of sorts. And my gathering place, of course, is uh, Alice's Garden. 
on uh, 21st in, in, in Garfield. And so while we're practicing social distancing and we're mindful, you know, of our interaction, you know, with the public, it's still giving us the opportunity to really come together and celebrate, you know, each other, celebrate uh, what it is that we, what, what we have learned, you know, from each other, celebrate our journeys, you know, celebrate our families. Uh, what I miss most is uh, my grandchildren. Uh, many of them have, have now moved to Charlotte, but even for those, well, actually the, the younger ones who, live in Milwaukee or actually in Charlotte right now too. So I, I, I just miss my grandchildren, but I have an opportunity to interact, you know, with other children, you know, in the community. And I find that to be, you know, very, very satisfying. So always an opportunity to be able to teach and learn and explore. Absolutely. Thank you so very much. You know, I used to live in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I will say that I am, I am far more active and outside more frequently in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, then in Charlotte, North Carolina. A lot of that has to do with how hot and humid it is in <laughs> Charlotte. Uh, but, uh, but it's also a testament to um, the, the commitment to being outdoors and engaging in outdoor activity that is present here, particularly in the months when it's, when it's not wintertime, but even when it's colder, you know, folks still get out quite a bit, which was a surprise to me. Manan, brother, what you missing these times? Um, I think what we're missing is some type of uh, of family environment. Like uh, it's funny because uh, through Hooker Crook, I've probably met a, uh, enough of Mrs. Zakia Courtney's uh, grand kids and grandkids. So um, not like everybody else, they probably <laughs> they probably you know are able to run into them a lot more than I, I have. But um, I miss I miss family uh, the, uh, and I miss seeing them at. Um, I have a large large family, but I miss seeing them at some of the festivals like African World Festival, right. even Summerfest. You know, there's sometimes, you know, during during period of Summerfest where you'll have, especially for Black people, you'll have like, um, you know, Maze and Frankie Beverly and, you know, some of those other acts that come through and, you know, you run into people who you haven't seen in a long period of time. So I really miss those um I really miss I miss African World Festival, like the African World Festival where, you know, you can you can run through um, on a Saturday or whatever day it is, and it's just like, boom, you know, black people, and it's and it's fun. So yeah. that's what I miss. And for those who who've never experienced African World Festival, like uh, like we have, uh, they definitely don't know what they're missing. So Manon, when you when you talk about that, and yes, you are the age of of some of my children. We could go to African World Festival at that time, and uh, I was very involved in it and would not have to worry about where our kids were at. You know, they could go about doing whatever it is that they want to do. They come back just to get more money. And, you know, and then, they, <laughs> and then they're gone, you know, for the rest of the day. You didn't have to worry about anybody bothering them, uh, anybody trying to snatch them. It was absolutely uh, uh, one of the best things that ever happened to Milwaukee. And that's African World Festival. And yes, I miss that tremendously. So many stories, so many memories, and uh, our children, including you, and I would say that you were raised on African World Festival. Yes, man. I was definitely raised at African World Festival. I mean, we and you're right. We ran end to end uh, from one side of Summerfest to the other side, even the forbidden areas that we, we got caught in. We would, you know, we would run from one side to the other. And it was just fun. I mean, you, if you knew, if you want to know what Africa is, like that, it was African World Festival. Absolutely. Well, thank you all so very much. I have, a, I have an anecdote I want to share. I want to get your, your feedback on it. Adam, this is not at all related to our topic today, but kind of, sort of, <laughs> in some ways. I was talking to a gentleman from Brazil a number of years ago, and he said, uh, he said Rob, tell me the, the music, the, the artist or the group that you think most typ typifies African American experiences, or if there's one group you would want me to listen to that kind of gets it, that kind of represents that that cultural aesthetic, what would it be? And I said, Maze featuring Frankie Beverly. And I know that there are hundreds of others, but the fact that you brought up Maze and Frankie Beverly in this conversation related to African World Fest, like that's that's so classic. And I just thought I'd share that, but. So yeah, right. Maze. If, if there's any, if there's a summertime gathering, if there's a birthday party, if there's a barbecue, Frankie Beverly shows up at some point. 
Yeah. yeah, like Frank Maze and Frankie Beverly are like the they're the modern day drum beat, modern day djembe drum, or you know they used to use dr drums to communicate to other villages in in Africa, and you know th those drums would bring t people together. And for whatever reason, you know you can put on Maze and Frankie Beverly, it can be a fight like between your two <laughs> drunk uncles, and they will stop. They will stop. <laughs> Now they might the go back the to fight after the song, but yeah, they will yeah. <laughs> they'll they'll do a little joy then the pain after. Yeah, right. <laughs> Missy Key, what do you think joy. about that statement? No, I think I mean I think that's true. I mean, music moves us. Music motivates us uh, to uh, in positive ways and negative ways. That's why there's so much dialogue about the music that uh, that modern day music and and what message is it actually sending. Um, so no, I, I absolutely, you know, agree. As I said, After World Festival represented the best, you know, of what it is that Milwaukee uh, in the Midwest, I would say, definitely had to offer. So cool. yeah. Well, thank you both. Thank you both. Let's go to the next slide. Let's get into some, you know, part of what we do. I mean, you want to jump in? I've been talking a lot. You want to run this? You slide? go ahead. Keep going. Okay. You know, part of what we do is we take these very uh, local experiences. Uh, these rich stories uh, uh, around some of our, our, our local voices and our local heroes. And we try to then also bring in these more, if, uh, for lack of a better term, academic topics so that the teachers who are talking about this stuff have some tools and the young people have the opportunity to think about these complicated ideas or ideas that are not so complicated, but then also able to think about them uh, in real time and on the ground. So we, we, we talk a little bit about human migration. Obviously, if we talk about the Black experience, we, we have to bring up the Great Migration and we have to bring up the, the connections between uh, southern, the, the southern region and the northern region and how our families cyclically move back and forth. Uh, obviously, when we think about the urban landscape, we have to uh, be mindful of topics such as gentrification and urban uh, development and planning and uh, how we uh, have been impacted by that, but also how uh, our communities have engaged with those processes uh, for the betterment of the communities. Uh, but ultimately, we're talking about community, culture, neighborhood, and as you all have highlighted, uh, family in so many ways. And so what we're trying to do is provide these rich local stories that then give us a window into some of these uh, broader, more in, in, uh, sophisticated and somewhat academic ideas. And so if you have any thoughts about uh, any of those topics, P please always feel free to share. Uh, always feel free to point us back to topics like migration or urban development. We know that you all have been involved in a whole range of those practices. Um, but really, let's let's go ahead and get started into some of our, uh, our questions that will move us along. And so we we chunk these in 15 to 20 minute uh, blocks. And so now we're moving into our, our next chunk, if you will. Adam, why don't you take over for a sec? Well, why don't we, you know, Manan and Zakia, what we'd love to do now is just hear a fuller version of your story into your life uh, with food and where you are today. Manan, I, Zakia already knows this. I went on Facebook through the, the Juice Kitchen Shindig Facebook page and I stacked up 25 images that kind of start at amaranth and end in the, the current world you're in now which one of you wants to go first well, I can talk a, yeah I'll, t I'll talk a little bit about in terms of uh, and i mentioned this uh a little bit in my introduction is that uh uh my journey in terms of food really just came as a mother all right and wanted to provide the absolute best you know for uh my children and as you grow you have an opportunity to be able to grow and provide even more, you know, for that. So my goal as a uh, chef, as well as a mother, was to go ahead and create delicious vegan food so that you would even, quote, unquote, miss meat. Okay? Sure. Mm -hmm. And so, like, on this picture that you see here, those are actually what we call vegan ribs, okay? Mm -hmm. Absolutely no meat product whatsoever. It's, it's uh, uh, actually made from flour, gluten flour, okay? And it's a process. But it's absolutely de delicious. I've never had anybody who did not like it, including those people who, you know, still consume meat. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so, you know, go ahead. I, I was going to just ask. So we're going to see some of these images. This is at the Body and Soul Healing Arts Center. 
Yeah. Can you talk about your decision of getting into veganism at all in the first place? Because especially 30 years ago, right. that might have felt kind of out on the, the margins. It was ahead of the game. It was. It was. And especially, especially it, it takes the kids, you know, to really talk about being vegetarian and, you know, pulling up to a, uh, 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 a Burger King and asking for a Whopper with no meat on it. You know, or <laughs> let me get the bun, bun's <laughs> lettuce, <laughs> extra, tomato, sauce. extra, yeah. tomato, extra right. sesame seeds. <laughs> so it takes it takes them to talk about it as well as a conversation I had uh, uh, that I moderated uh, uh, about a month or so ago with Ayanna Gregory, who is Dick Gregory's uh, daughter, mm-hmm. and so she echoed the same thing that my children now echo too in terms of how, you know, other people would talk about them and they were made, you know, to go ahead and, and feel weird. Sure. Uh, <laughs> and so with the Body and Soul Center, you know, which no longer exists, it was the, uh, one of the first places that I actually started vending. And that was from invitation to, uh, by Venus Williams. She had uh, had my food. She knew, you know, that I love to cook. And she just said, hey, why don't you come? We have this market on Saturday. Why don't you come and uh, set up and see, you know, and see what happens? And that's what I did. And that's how I got started. That particular picture there, I think, well, it was at, a, at an event. It was at a catered event. And so I was really excited about the opportunity to be able to share what it is that I've known and learned, you know, throughout these years. But again, starting out, um, I did good. I mean, the kids ate it. They survived. <laughs> but there were some things that... <laughs> There's some things that they might even talk about today, like, Mama, you really gave us, you know, whatever it was. But Stuff anyway. like this and this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, That's yeah. Right. <laughs> well, see, and that was the other thing. I was uh, through Fondy Market. Fondy Market used to have what was called a greens cooking contest. Mm-hmm. And, and so uh, one year I decided to go ahead and enter it just to see, you know. And so I entered the greens cooking contest. And that first year I, I, uh, I took second place, right? And I was surprised, so I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to do it again next year. I did it next year. I took first place, and I held first place for a few years until I decided, like, okay, somebody else needs to have that opportunity. But that was one of my specialties, and it still is, is to being able to prepare greens. And for the listening audience, we're talking about collard greens, mustard, turnip greens, yeah. spinach greens, potato yeah. greens, you know, all those things that uh, are traditionally in our culture, people had to prepare or thought they needed to prepare with meat. You know, mm-hmm. they had, had, uh, pork. uh, yeah, pork. I was trying yeah. to think the specific name of it, but anyway, yeah, they all, they had some type of pork product, couldn't imagine themselves, you know, preparing greens without, this is trust me out sometimes, turkey butts. I'm like, turkey yeah. butts. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, you can get, you can get cussed out at a family yeah. gathering for bringing some greens without pork in it, you know? Yeah, yeah, or smoked turkey tails or whatever. And I'm like, you know, uh, and I do teach people, you know, how, how to do this. And so I put my greens that are made with absolutely no meat, no dairy products whatsoever up against anybody's uh, ham hock. Okay. Yeah. Oh, somebody said smoke ham hock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kia, let me ask you a question. You mentioned, you mentioned a couple places, and I think it's important for us to, uh, particularly for the young people who are going to be listening in and those who are, paying, who are with us now, uh, Alice's Garden and yep. Fondy Market. Yeah. Can, can you just talk about the significance of those institutions? And then, Manon, if you want to add some comments, too, because I know, I know you have some thoughts on this. I, you know, we want to make sure we shout out those, those entities and icons um, and places in our city. And, and, and can you talk a little bit about those, too, for just a second? Alice's Garden and Fondy Market. You want me or Manon to talk? You want oh, go to ahead. Talk please, please start, Mr. Key. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, Fondy Market... Uh, 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 is the largest, I think, outdoor farmer's market that we have, you know, here in Milwaukee. And it's an absolutely wonderful place, you know, th- to be. Again, there's some restrictions now because of, of, of the pandemic. But being able to go there, it's almost like a festival, too. It's a happening, too, where you run into people who have the same thing in common. They're looking for, you know, good, fresh food. And there at, far- at Friday Market, you can get food directly, you know, from the farmers. Everything that they sell, they have to have produced you know, themselves. Um, They have food demos, and I've been a part of that, which is really good, because sometimes you see food at the market, it's like, okay, this looks pretty interesting, but I don't know what to do with it. Like like, uh, okra leaf. You know, I never knew that okra, that the leaf from the okra plant is actually edible, okay? 
And I learned that, I discovered that at the Findy Market. And so, yeah, I do an okra stew with okra leaf mm. uh, now. And so uh, having the demo, the opportunity to learn, have people who, again, aren't accustomed to eating uh, fresh vegetables uh, actually taste the food and say, oh, this is really good. And then being able to hand them a recipe and say, well, this is how you do it to make yeah. it really simple. That's been really, really good. So, you know, Finding Market is a real gem that exists in, the, in our community. The other one I want to mention, too, is Trickle Bee Cafe. Yeah, okay? should I just get to... Yeah. I think I got it. Some of these plates are from, like this plate, that's a very Trickle Bee looking plate right there. It is, it is. That's Trickle Bee Cafe, and that's probably, some, I did do that, yeah. Uh, and that Trickle Bee Cafe, what's significant about that is Trickle Bee is a pay what you can cafe. And so this click, this particular pay here looks like it has vegan chicken on it. It has a, a, a soup, might be carrot, ginger soup. It has a, um, a rice ball with tempeh on it. That's what those two little bacon strips look like, a salad and a muffin. Everything totally vegan. Uh, even the, the cream that's in the soup, non-dairy, everything. And the great thing about Trickle Bee is that it's a pay what you can. And I'm the, I'm the chef there every Friday. I volunteer there every Friday to go ahead and prepare you know. food for them. Yeah. Yeah. And then with, at Alice's Garden, yeah. uh, where I'm at every Tuesday, I also have a plot where I, a lot of the greens that I'm talking about, I actually grow. Okay. Uh, one of the things I'm proud of this year is red okra. And most mm. people are like, what? Yeah, red okra is absolutely you know, delicious. And uh, the leaf, as I said, is, is uh, edible too. And being able to make an okra stew and people are like, ooh, I do not like okra. Well, you haven't tasted mine, so that's why you say that. But anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Manon, jump in. Talk, us, talk to us a little bit about Alice's Garden yeah. and some of the other uh, uh, urban farming you've been up to. Garden, Alice's Garden. Say, say it again. I said, yeah, go ahead and talk about Alice's Garden for us. Yeah, Alice's Garden is a fantastic place. Um, once it one, it's right in the, in the heart of of uh, the kind of the Walnut Way, Lindsay Heights, um, Walnut area. Uh, it's in the back of the Brown Street um, School Academy, and it houses a number of plots for people who are in who are live, work, serve, play in the, uh, in the community. Um, it also is, it has a fit, strong affiliations to Fondy Food Market, also um, Walnut Way Conservation Corporation. But besides that, uh, it ho it has a pavilion in that whole, you know, mall having meetings out there uh, just um, for our uh, just for our men's group that I was running at the at Walnut Way Conservation Corporation um, a couple of years ago. So uh, it, it has a, a significant um, amount of potential um, because it's right in our, our neighborhood and everybody sees it. So you bring your ideas and your thoughts mm -hmm. into this particular, in this, in, into this garden and it, they don't, they don't shun you. You know, I think one thing about our community is that uh, we have a lot of ideas and if we're able to ground those ideas in the ground, then we can, we can prosper as a community and gardening is probably the, the, the ground zero of, of, uh, of, uh, of our thoughts and ideas. Especially you, know, in the garden. you know, Venus Williams, who's the executive director of Alice's garden would be with us right now, but for the fact that she's leading a reading circle in Alice's garden right now. And I think <laughs> Manon, the point you made there is so perfect, which is when you go to Venus, who's, you know, the leader of Alice's garden, what she'll say, which I think is the kind of leadership we need is whether it's an idea or a plant, she'll help you plant that but it's then going to be your job to tend it, right? right. So mm -hmm. she's not going to say to you, give me your idea and I'll take it over. She, she helps people grow their ideas, which is a beautiful analogy and metaphor for what happens in the garden, both in terms of the, the produce that, that grows as well as the people and community that grow there. Yep, absolutely. Whether it's veganism, whether it's juicing, um, and, and Manan, you can start... Uh, what does it mean for our communities that uh, we're, we're having these very vibrant conversations about this, this level of wellness? This is, this is wellness in another conversation. This is not just simply exercise. Um, it's not just making sure to eat a salad for dinner. 
You know, we're, we're talking about veganism. We're talking about juicing. Um, make, make some sense out of this for us. Like, this is happening in, in, in remarkable ways in the African-American community. What does all this mean? Well, I think right now we're at a sobering, uh, we're in a sobering movement and our movement isn't, a, isn't just about um, black power because it is right. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's, uh, it's about uh, being sober, moving into the movement and moving through the movement and moving past the, the movement of black power. I think we, we have to realize that um, food is at the heart of most conversations and food is also uh, a soul a soul conversation you can sit down and you know you can drink some juice with somebody or eat some vegan food or just eat you know some regular food <laughs> or whatever it is yeah. and you don't have to say anything and it's a conversation just through the ums and the ahs so uh it's past the, the us discussing um health and wellness through food uh and and gardening um, is well past just you know exercising and, and all that stuff. It's it's um, it's a party. It's your spirit. It's it's feeling your it's feeling your spirit. That's what yeah. that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to sp- fill up our spirit before we leave this place. That's number ace number one. Yeah. And and. I think people are now starting to realize that before when we got jumped into COVID, people were like drinking their heads off, you know, right. but then we start, to, we're starting to see, we're starting to see, and we're starting to realize that we're losing um, people to this condition, whatever it is, COVID, coronavirus, whatever, whatever you could call it. Right. Um, people are, people are dying. Uh, mm-hmm. It's not, uh, it's not, super alarming but it's really alarm it's alarming enough that we are losing um a lot of our older people to this uh by hook or crook and um i think those 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 people that are leaving uh including me i've lost i lost my dad not to covid but we are we know that because covid is bringing people inside and sitting them down uh and people are not as active then where those people are are um, coming to the realization that uh, life isn't just um, you know you know drinking and entertainment man it's it life can be sobering and mm-hmm. now we've come to this position in life where in this life that uh, we have to be sober and we have to have real conversations. Absolutely. You know, before we um, wrap up this section, I just wanted to finish with Zakia. Um, you know, you started your life as in, in veganism 30 years ago. You indoctrinated your family into it. Maybe it took them a little bit of convincing, but now you provide food for people all over the community. Can you just talk a little bit about these next couple images that we're going to look at here? <laughs> Some of these fine people mm-hmm. and what they're doing uh, that lies totally within your legacy. This is... Uh, Vigo, Mm -hmm. and this is a celebrity chef. Just from having scrolled through her images on Instagram and Facebook, I'm like, I am, give me some of that. That looks incredible. (laughs) So tell us what we just saw there. Okay, so as as we talk about the journey to uh, become plant-based, at the time that that my husband and I had made the decision, and we made the decision based upon information that was being provided to us, as well as health reasons. My husband was told, you know, by, by a doctor that he was borderline diabetic and, and with hypertension. And he had the option of either changing his diet or going on medication. And so he decided, and we decided to go ahead and change our diet. I had already been changing, you know, some uh, uh, in advance of that. But for him, it was like, like, almost like, you know, cold turkey in terms of things that he was no longer consuming. Anyway. When we, made, when we made that decision, we had uh, uh, maybe six children, you know, at, at home at the time. And the uh, oldest, which is Jabari, uh, he changed. And then my youngest, who was like two at the time, that was Yomi, uh, he changed. He didn't have a choice. Uh, but two of them, two of them in between, uh, Ajoya and uh, Akil, the one you just saw the two pictures of, they resisted the most. Joya, Joya was sneak food. She would have her friends bring her meat. 
She would do all kinds. <laughs> Meatballs in her purse. <laughs> yeah, she would do all kinds of things. She would do all kinds of measures to be defined, even to the point that we were in a park one day and she ate a brat off somebody else's grill, a meat brat <laughs> off somebody else's grill. And she had an allergic reaction to it. And we wound up having to rush her to the hospital because her throat was, was, was closed up. It was funny at first, but then it got to be real serious. So she had to go to, she wound up in the emergency room. She is now a, 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 a celebrity vegan chef. She's won so many contests for her mac and cheese and other things. She beat out other chefs in contests who were making, you know, meat, you know, kind of dishes. She's just that good. And, uh, and then the other one, Akil, he was the same way. He resisted. He found all kinds of ways to go ahead and, and get meat because the rule was you couldn't eat meat in the house, but whatever you do outside, that was up to you. He too now is a vegan chef, phenomenal, has uh, his own uh, truck. If you saw a picture of that before, Vigo and his business, his, his wife turns out some phenomenal cakes. I don't know if you saw that on the website, uh, Adam, but uh, they're doing well. And, and both of them are located in Charlotte. Uh, Akil left his job as a general manager for uh, a restaurant chain to go ahead and start his own business. Uh, Joya, you know, is totally self-sustaining. Both of them are self-sustaining based on, you know, their own business. So I'm really proud of them. I'm proud of all of my children, but those two in particular as vegan chefs. Don't don't tell your children this, but Kill was one of my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> don't leak, let this leak out to Jabari. He probably uh, said, oh, un unsolicited, Manon. Yeah, you're looking. talking to a you're talking to a vegan, and you're starting beef for no reason. <laughs> Get you, Manon. Get out of here. And we on Facebook. <laughs> and we on. Oh, yeah, you it was too late. You did it, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> but uh, that, that was, you know, that was, as I said, we've had some really, really interesting journeys. That, and one of the things I want to say, too, because, uh, Rob, you've mentioned veganism, mm -hmm. and I want to make a distinction between veganism and plant-based, and plant based, all sure, right? Uh, because some people who look at the whole thing about vegan and, and Manai, you talked about movements and stuff, they look, you know, it's all, you know, all about animal rights and, you know, a lot, lots of different things. But it can be used to divide us. And I don't get into that argument, you know, whatsoever. You know, if you want to say plant-based because uh, that's what we're talking about as it relates to food, then so be it. But there's mm -hmm. some people who take the whole concept of veganism to a whole nother place, that's again, true. that can create divisions. And I'm not about that. Mm -hmm. When you talk about food for gathering, one of the things for sure is that when you serve vegan food, everybody can eat. Okay? When we come to the table, everybody can eat. And so that's what that's what I stand for. Well, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, let, let, let's talk a little bit about this this broader conversation around uh, urban farming and urban wellness and, and reconnecting to the land. We 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 played with this subtitle a little bit, and we really wanted to get some thoughts about uh, to hear from you all your thoughts about the importance of reconnecting to the earth. You know, we live in an urban space. Uh, space is limited. How important has it been that folks are now growing their own food, that there's a, there's a wide scale movement to, to take urban farming more seriously uh, and to move that toward a, a broader conversation around wellness? Can you, can, you talk, can you reconnect us to the land? Let me just put it that way. Why is that important? And, and either of you can, can jump in whenever you feel ready. I think it's important, um, one, I, I, and I hit it, hinted on it earlier is that um, our land has uh, in land period, wherever you are, whatever land it is, uh, has electricity. And our bodies are made up of protons, neutrons, electrons, you name it, we got it right. And we have the whole periodic table from chemistry all inside of us, plus uh, elements that are not a part of us. Um, inside of us that are not that we're not knowledge of that have that are inside of us uh, our bodies you know conduct uh conduct power through the through the land and the moment that we place any type of seed into the ground we absorb that power we absorb all of that power and Ms. Zakia uh, said it, you know, said it all the way. You know, um, being in that garden is is nothing but power. 
And uh, we that's what people are starting to rediscover is the fact that, you know, we're living in a, uh, you know, living in a, in a world under a, under a, uh, a, you know, a president and a political structure that um, wants this place to, to be in chaos. But ultimately, you know, people were saying like, well, since we're in chaos, we're going to, we want to reground ourselves in our backyards and especially in urban dwellings. This is what we're doing. Um, where it even, you know, places like, you know, what we call a newer brick city, uh, majority of the homes have gardens. Wow. Like you can walk down the street and it can be, you know, not, not great, you know, homes, not great looking homes, but you'll see tomatoes. Mm -hmm. And like, and this is 90% of the blocks. Yeah. Um, you'll see the, the guys who were, you know, just at the corner store buying, you know, uh, a, a pint, um, going back and kind of clipping a tomato. <laughs> right. So it, right. It's an amazing, it's an amazing feat and it's an amazing journey. And these are some, some brand new uh, gardens. So just imagine, you know, having, having power uh, in, in your hands. Yeah. Uh, the, that's yeah. Tell, tell us some of your thoughts about the importance of reconnecting to the land and the earth. You know, give, give us some of your, your thoughts. Well, you know, I totally agree with um, Manon and what he said. And, you know, it's interesting that I had a, a phone call maybe about an hour before, you know, we got on, on this call with one of my uh, uh, elderly neighbors, meaning that she's older than me. She's like in her 80s. And she called with an uh, idea that I thought was just so perfect. She said, Sakia, what do you think? if we uh, did something on our block where everybody would have a garden and we would grow food and share the food that we grow, you know, with each other, you know, meaning that somebody might grow squash, somebody might specialize in tomatoes, somebody might specialize in greens. <clears throat> and then we just share what it is that we grow with each other. And I told her, I said, Ms. Juanita, that's an excellent idea. You know, and she wanted to know if we could do it for this year. I said, well, it's, it's probably too late for this year unless we're going to you know, do just fall vegetables, but just in terms of creating that plan and moving forward on that for next year, I told her I'm with her. And she even took it a step further. She said, well, yeah, I think that instead of us just passing out flowers, that we should go to each of our neighbor's house one-on-one -on -one and present them with this idea. I said, Ms. Juanita, that's a great idea. So being able to connect, and she just did this a couple, uh, couple, couple hours ago, but being able to connect to the land and then being able to connect to our community is a natural connection that we have lost. There were many people prior, uh, I would say my generation, yeah, I'm baby boomers. There were many people in the baby boomer generation, black people in particular, that didn't want to have anything to do with gardening or farming because it was so connected with our experience in the South. And, and, and many people had to work so hard that they wanted to leave that part of their lives behind. Mm -hmm. Not everybody. But, you know, there, there were a great majority. And then there were some, like my father, who would always have like some collars or something in the, in, planted in the background, the backyard. Never made a big deal, you know, out of it. So as, as a young adult, I never thought about gardening. But what affected me, what impacted me in terms of gardening was a friend that I had, had uh, met who lived in uh, Parkland, okay? And which is, and yeah, park line, subsidized housing. Mm -hmm. And what she did was she would take the area that was right around her house, okay, and she would plant. And then every year she would expand it a little more because you're not supposed to do that, you know, right. when you live in subsidized housing. But she did. And the uh, housing authority didn't bother her because it was so beautiful. In fact, what the housing authority eventually did was use her garden and her house to show perspective tenants for the uh, housing, what, you know, what, what you can do in terms of taking care and enhancing your property. I don't know if they still do it or not, but she was the one that got me really interested in gardening. And at that point, I just turned my whole backyard, you know, into to a, a garden. Then I got involved in working. And so I didn't have a chance to pay as much attention to it as I wanted to. But I always knew that once I retired, I would go back, you know, to that. And that's exactly, you know, what I did. So when you, we talk about connecting to the land, you know, connecting to families, connecting to our wellness, you know, we have an herbal apprentice program where we learn from each other about different herbs. So when not, as you talked about, you know, your grandfather and the role that he played, 
You know, we should, and many of us are doing the exact same thing. There are many of us that knew, you know, that when this whole COVID thing came up, that, you know, uh, get the elderberry syrup and where to get it from and what other kind of herbs that you can do. My right. grandchildren participated in a, a soul, soil, and something program that we had when you had the garden. My granddaughter got stung by a bee, right? She knew exactly what plant to go to and pull a leaf off of there to go ahead and give her some relief. All right. Vermont, did, right? Huh? That Vermont. was one. I think that I think the one that she used was mullen. Okay. Okay. Mullen, yeah. mullen and bee balm, yeah. Yeah. But she knew exactly what to do. She didn't freak out or anything. She just knew what plant to go to and wrap around, you know, her arm for that bee sting, you know, that, that she had. So again, when we look at what role that all of this plays, you know, in Detroit, they had a huge movement with all these vacant lots, they wanted mm -hmm. to go ahead and turn, in, turn into community gardens. Yes, they need to do that, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, the uh, 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 the uh, one that Andre Lee Ellis had, you know, mm -hmm. on Ninth and Ring, and how he has engaged so many of the young men, you know, in that neighborhood in terms of, of the gardening and the kind of programs that he able, he's able to bring to the garden as a result of the garden being there and those young men being there and having a capture audience. So we, can't, we can never underestimate the power that gardening and urban farms have. And now with the millennials, the millennials, that particular generation has really you know, picked it up. I've watched them in uh, Alice's garden, how they come, how they've tended to the land, how they're using techniques that you know, we may not even know. And yeah. so again, you can't underestimate the power of, of, of connecting with the earth and Manan, as you said, connected with the seed, because everything starts from the seed. And being able to take the seed, plant the seed, whether or not the seed is going into your ground, into the ground, or going into your mind, it goes into your soul, it goes into your spirit. And that allows it to grow and develop into what it is that we're seeing today in terms of people really caring, not only about their environment, but their wellness and the sustainability. All right. Thank you. Thank you so very much. We Go ahead, Manon, you want to say something? Wow, that was like, that's right. That's it. <laughs> you know, as we enter into the last stretch, I mean, one thing Venus Williams says, just to paraphrase her a little bit, she'll, she'll make this point to people who visit the garden that we would not be here were it not for the uh, ability and deep heritage with growing food that black people have, right? right. Like literally humanity right. would not exist were it not for that ability, nor would this country exist. I, I would love if we can pull this off. I don't know if we can, but Manan, I have a bunch of pictures. I actually got emotional looking at them today, just kind of walking through, mm -hmm. uh, starting with these bottles, which look like potions in a video game <laughs> um, filled with delicious juice. I have 25 images that kind of walk through your uh, experience at the juice kitchen yeah. and into Shindig. Uh, and there's actually a part of the reason I got emotional is that I've seen all these amazing people being in places, right. which is, yeah. seems long ago. But here's Janine Edwards at Cafe Amaranth. Go along. Boiler yeah. up. We went to college together. Yeah. <laughs> there you, here you are at Alice's Garden. Yeah. Holding, I, well, what's in that, what's in that gallon? Um, purple haze. There it is. <laughs> yeah. That looks like when you first started, you used to deliver gallons of juice to us we used to buy it yep yep here's uh your next step so you got started in the the kitchen here at amaranth and this building yeah parks place was Woo! that's crazy man <laughs> i just got this from your facebook so somebody uh, it's funny because somebody i had a friend um walk walk in the studs with me and this is this is the, I had a friend. I mean, he's still my friend, but he's a multi-millionaire. And he said this will never work. I said, wow. I said, gotcha. Right. Yeah. My father, yeah. Uh, my father. People know knew my father. And one thing you you can't tell him is something is you can't tell you can't say can't. Right. <laughs> so you you, you took it. a you took a big swing, kind of pouring your whole life, your whole future. There's Yvette. Ashley, yeah, wow. some great people. Yeah. And then, so speaking of can't, uh, here's you 
canning. <laughs> yes, you can. And actually, speaking of which, That's the, my dad. the gentleman who said you can't say can't, uh, I miss this space. I'm not, I'm, I'm, you know, and, and the team and the, the vibe that was in there. Yep. Great energy in the Jill's kitchen, man. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just to, I mean, how revolutionary it was. I mean, really on 17th and North Avenue where the Juice Kitchen was and will always be in my heart, <laughs> you yeah. know, it felt like the, the kinds of conversations, the kinds of people, kind of weird stuff that would happen in there. Like, who's this guy? What's he doing? That's, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Get a yoga mat out. Um, yeah. Challenging people to detox, to think uh, – really intentionally about who they are and what's going into their body man that was a uh if you, if you go back to that the two guys i'm holding uh in my arms one guy just called my sister um and said you know i, I you know i helped him uh change his life because I, I i had to front on him and i just stepped on his toes i said you're not doing you know you're not doing anything and he said what well, what have you made? And we just had this big long conversation. Two years later, or a couple years later, he calls me. So the guy, the other guy, uh, another guy is in uh, Cali, and he's re- he's a recording artist. He's also um, a straight vegan. So he's mm-hmm. vegan, and it, like he basically is. He's a faster. I'm gonna call him a faster because he, he he he's like it's like it's like collard greens and water. <laughs> but it's oh, cool you know, though. The- um, the juice kitchen was this space to where you made juice for people, but then it became a place for conversation. It became a chase, place for relationship, which you then sort of leveled up again as you became entwined with the whole remarkable Sherman Phoenix yeah. project. Yeah. I remember the early conversations, Manon, about the Phoenix. Great. Yeah. Meanwhile, Command Central is like, yeah, so- we appreciate the nostalgia, but we only got five minutes left. <laughs> I, I think this is this is we, when we leveled yeah. up. When we leveled up, um, we de- we determined that um, that all things don't don't you know stay the same. You gotta be you gotta change. Yeah. And like our lives, uh, we wanted to make sure that you no know, step to the plate and did something completely different. And we we are in our in our family just you know ten seconds in our family we, we want to make sure that we do things one eighty. Um, about faces, something different, and that's what we read upon when my wife and I uh, was to just completely do things that are uh, left field. <laughs> yeah. so. But we, we do need to start moving to Q&A, uh, and we're going to start getting some questions from our attendees. Um, but let's, let's start with one that is both simple and complex. Ms. Zakia, what do we need to be teaching our young people? When we're in the classroom talking about food and culture in Milwaukee, uh, what, are, what are some jewels that you can provide for us uh, to make sure we emphasize in the classroom with teenagers and college students and even middle schoolers, you know? What, what are some lessons, man? I think it should be hands-on, you know, because mm. people learn best, you know, with hands-on. Uh, again, I'll go way back because I remember a time where in school, you, you know, one of your projects was to grow a uh, sweet potato, the leaves from the sweet potato. It would sit in your window for a while or from potato, you know, just to go ahead and watch that process. You know, so I think that when we look at food, you know, and culture is that we need to connect to see, see where food has come from, what it is that, that you can and cannot do with it. Uh, I remember uh, having a grandson one time at a farm and uh, the the cherry tomatoes and I kind of plucked one off and put it in my mouth and my grandson's like, oh, grandma, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm eating a tomato. He's like, that's not a tomato. You get tomatoes from the store. I'm like, oh, okay. That's when I knew I had to have a garden. I needed to have a garden. So the first thing I would say is is be hands on with it and be able to connect, you know, the culture or uh, connect a food with the culture it comes from whether or not we're talking about yams and sweet potatoes coming from West Africa, you know, or, or we're talking about where it is that rice is cultivated, where it is that it grows. Every, every food product has a culture that's connected to it. It has a history that's connected to it. And we are 
connected to that. And so it's, it's something that we need to know. Um, the other question here is what's unique about the culinary scene in Milwaukee is that it is progressing. And I like what Manan said in terms of the changes that you know, he and his family has, has made. The culinary scene is progressing in, this mo in, in Milwaukee. And sometimes I look up and it's like, oh wow, there's another vegan chef, which yeah. is good. I welcome that. You know, I welcome that. I'm just saying it's not even a matter of, of competing. You know, it's a matter of contributing because who it is that I can't reach, maybe somebody else can reach them. And that's the most important thing is that we do those things that we need to do on behalf of our community so that we, you know, we'd be better in it. What yeah. do I hope to see in, 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 in the culinary scene in the next decade? Just more. You know, last week, uh, Friday, I did a, uh, uh, a vegan, I did a vegan fish fry. All right. Mm -hmm. And the product I used was banana blossom. Now, I'm pretty sure most of you have never had banana blossom. Mm -hmm. but, if you, but if you tasted that vegan fish I made last week, you would be amazed that it was not indeed fish. Okay. Not at all. So that's, mm -hmm. what, that's what I'm looking for. More creativity, more kinds of things that we can share, more types of food entrepreneurs, you know, like Manon and others. But now, if, if we're in the classroom with, with high schoolers and middle schoolers or even college students, what are some of the key teachable lessons? What, what do you want them to know? What should we be emphasizing around these questions associated with food and culture and community and Milwaukee? Give, give us some of your thoughts because we, we do use these very practically. I want to make sure you all know that you're, you're, you're teaching us how to be better educators right now. You're muted. You're muted, Manon. Sorry about that. I, I think that um, one of the major uh, teachable lessons I could say to the students um, of the, the Milwaukee uh, culinary scene, uh, especially the Black Milwaukee culinary scene, um, is to start small, is to, is to uh, analyze. I always tell people to break down, uh, break down the the smallest item, and start there. Um, for example, uh, try to break down in 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 this. I'm a kind of a scientist at heart, but break down the the compounds in uh, a Frito Lay or a Cheeto, or break down the compounds in in uh in an apple and why it makes you feel so good when you eat it why does it why uh, do doctors tell you um, an apple day keeps the doctor away you know analyze those particular um anecdotes but also analyze why uh why food makes it uh, makes a difference or not or it doesn't make a difference so it i would say try to start small and just work your way out. That's the best thing I could really teach and tell people um, about food. Uh, never, never bite off more than you can chew. <laughs> Appreciate that. All right, let's go to the next slide. We're going, we're going to uh, wrap up our Facebook Live, uh, and then we're going to hang out for just another five or so minutes in case folks have a few more questions. Um, we, we will have a conversation um, in about a week or so, a table talk, we call it, 8 p.m. Uh, where's the date for that? July 30th, where we will give our educators an opportunity to talk through what we've been discussing this month and share some more tips and share some classroom strategies um, uh, with the beverage of your choice. And then on August 5th and August 12th, we will begin to talk about uh, voting the fifth we'll, we'll do a history of voting um, and then on the 12th we'll talk uh, what uh, about what occurred on August 11th and then start prepping for November in some other ways let me just say Miss Zakia and, and Manan my 12 year old son will periodically say dad I need some more vegetables mm -hmm. good he'll also say dad you haven't juiced any ginger in a while uh, he's he's been sitting right next to me and he he's commented about uh, some of the things that they do in his school around gardening. And I just want to personally thank you both 
and being a part of the village that's educating my child about not only his own sense of identity, but uh, how to be healthy as he, he grows and shapes that identity. And Manan, you've met him, obviously, and he knows you, Miss Zakia. He's, he's been in the spaces when you've catered. So let me personally thank you both. Adam, you want to say anything, and then we'll close out on Facebook. Well, I guess um, I think as Zakia pointed out, as an answer to the first question, the best way to experience any of what we're talking about is by tasting it, right? So Zakia um, is at Trickle B on Fridays for lunch, which I encourage Rob to go to last week and said, he said instead he's going to eat a box of oatmeal cream pies. He said it, not me. <laughs> and, and also you have a residency on, at Alice's Garden. Beef. That's beef. <laughs> we're not talking about beef today. Well, <laughs> you got to go meatless if you don't want beef, Rob. So Zakia also <laughs> on Tuesdays at Alice's Garden does dinners as well. Is there anywhere else that the folks can get your uh, your cuisine on a regular basis? That on a regular basis, that's it right now. Um, like you said, Fridays from eleven to two at Trickle B Cafe, and Tuesday evenings from four to seven at Alice's Garden. Once a month, I'm um, at Alice's Garden on Thursday. I think I'm there next week Thursday too. And Rob, if you have a thing for beef, then uh, I got something for you. Uh, yesterday, oh, no, I, I, I don't. Yesterday, I made, I don't. yesterday I made a vegan beef, uh, vegan meatloaf that you would absolutely love. But on Tuesdays, I usually have uh, uh, burgers, and I got a couple of specialty burgers. I got one just for you, so make sure you stop by. I'm not a big beef eater, so I'm, I'm coming to get both of those. <laughs> so, and Manan, I've heard rumors of uh, your juice being available again in the near future. Yep. Uh, can you tell us anything about when folks can have uh, in their hand a bottle of your your elixir, uh, okay. maybe maybe at their their front door? Yep. And so, as a part of our 180, uh, <laughs> it, this the, our journey is funny. It's completely funny. I, I actually, we we laugh about it almost every day. But um, no, every day we kind of wake up and it's like a, it's a joke um, because we don't we didn't know how we got here. I think. That's number one. But uh, number two, um, Shindig Juice is is going online in the next couple of days, um, and it'll be uh, you know available to everybody on a national platform. We are being mentored through Pepsi Co. Uh, uh, Pepsi uh, has been tremendous, and also, uh, believe it or not, they gave they're giving um, four hundred thirty million dollars to. Um, to all black causes. So um, we are uh, kind of on the front end of hoping and helping uh, to um, determine where that, uh, that money goes. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're a small percentage of that, not a whole, you know, 100%. Um, very, very grain, small grain. But, uh, but yes, the the shindig juice you'll be get you'll be able to get it in another another couple of days you can order it online uh it'll come to your door also you can get it from uh two locations uh either sauce and spice um right now and um our friends at collectivo so uh we'll start there and we'll go from go from there to to everywhere well, thank you both very much. We're going to end our Facebook live feed right now. And if you can just hold on for a few more minutes, we'd appreciate it. Thank you so very much, folks. And thank you for joining us on Facebook. Thank you. Okay, we are no longer live on Facebook. We got a few folks still hanging out with us. If anybody wants to ask a question or two, please feel free. And then we'll get uh, Manon and Miss Akia out of here. They've got plenty of things to do. Miss Akia, I'm, I'm uh, how can I get the, let me, let me start with the question. How can I get the meatloaf? Where, where, what do I need to do to get the meatloaf? Let me just. I would tell you I have some left over, but I think I have some left. But I have to, I have to check. I have people in my house, so leftovers don't usually last too long. <laughs> and I'll, I'll be patient too. I'll be patient. That's uh, that reminds me. That look reminds me of my grandmother because every time <laughs> I would come by, she would have a, a, a pound cake on the on the table and I would like or on the radiator I'd be like man grandma and do you have any more pound cake and she'll sometimes look 
And it was like, oh, I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you Friday at Trickle because Adam has been pushing me to stop over there on Friday. So I'll make sure to get over there this week. Okay. Anybody got any questions? Anybody, any, any attendees? Go ahead, Nate. You're, um, if you're talking, you're muted. Sorry, I just had my hand up like like that. It looked like I was trying to talk, but I wasn't. But I appreciate everybody's time and expertise in this area. And I've got a lot of food that I got to start trying to eat. So thank you so much for being here today. And and real quick, Nate, can you just introduce yourself? Because I think it's important for these folks to know what you're up to. Yeah, my, I'm a school counselor in West Dallas at Central High School. Partnered up with Rob on a couple things, uh, leadership and brotherhood, a thing down at uh, Marquette, which was great. And uh, from there, just got plugged into this March on Milwaukee series. And it's something I look forward to every week. So it's, it's been fabulous. So thank you, Adam and everybody. And Kristen and Heather. Oh, Lisa, what's going on, Lisa? We've got a number of folks who've been in the mix, making sure that we, we can continue these. Um, you know, Nate's been working with what is a very rapidly increasing number of African-American students in the West Dallas district. Uh, and he's really been committed to getting those uh, young men and women into conversations that are important mm -hmm. for them. And uh, you all are doing some curricular reform and overhauls and everything. So, you know, we're here to be as supportive. We know how difficult it is as those students uh, transition into an environment, uh, you know, unfamiliar to them and they are unfamiliar to other folks. So, any Thank other you. questions? Anybody got anything else? Cool. All righty, Ms. Zakia, Manan, we thank you so very much. We won't keep you any longer. Uh, we'll be in touch via email just with a few follow-up things, and then um, we, we'll, we'll be coming to eat. And Manan, I'm coming to get some juice, or I'm ordering it online or whatever. Yeah. Uh, ASAP. Yeah. One thing about our juice is that now we're, we're able to produce it, um, mass produce it, and uh, just a reminder to mass produce and also it'll be able to be able to stay store <laughs> shelf stable um, for s up to 60 days. So uh, non-pasteurized, but we have a process to help us uh, um, keep it uh, shelf stable. So I'm looking forward to that. Yes. We'll start with um, three juices. We have our ginger um, yeah. and then we'll kind of roll out the, you know, the Mike Tyson punches after that. What are the three, the first three? Purple Haze, North Ave, and uh, Real Bucks. And then our, we call the, our ginger is our ginger bang. We didn't go straight ginger yet um, because um, the prices of ginger because uh, have skyrocketed. So I want to kind of keep that sure. down. When does Seawalk and Soul Food debut? Those are the ones yeah. I missed the most. So those will be coming up uh, hopefully in the near, like 2021. So, I mean, a couple months. Yeah. And then uh, Black Lemonade will be coming up too. Yeah, cool. you know, I was going for the Black Lemonade. That was the next question. So, yeah, yeah. But what the goal is to make sure that we have, um, you know, Black, uh, a Black juice company at a national level, um, you know, working with a, uh, working with a national or international company. So, that was, that was a part of my dream and uh, hopefully we're, we're making it happen. Cool. All right. Mr. Key, I will see you Friday. All right. Look forward to seeing you. Nine, I will be in touch. Thanks everybody for joining. We're going to wrap up now and um, we'll see you tomorrow for those who take part and then we'll see you next month, the 5th and the 12th. Bye mama. Bye.